Thank you, Donna. Um, we like to um, go ahead and, and uh, we had forgot to do our alabaster offering last month, so this Sunday we will be taking up alabaster offering. Um, and the NMI books, um, Angie's not here today, but um, don't forget about the NMI books if you'd like to have one, uh, see her. Um, Pastor Toby also has the CD. You still have the CD? or Yeah. If you'd like to, to take a CD to listen, just uh, get with him. Um, any other announcements? Yeah, three books. Well, there's the there's the um, the yeah. on assignment from God is an old one that I had suggested to people to read because uh, I've been doing a lot of references to it in my sermons and stuff. So it's there and available to read. So Angie would have that. And there is the ladies retreat in Elkins that's coming up. Um, if you'd like to go, just uh, see me or see Angie. I uh, uh, deadline is tomorrow for registration, uh, which is uh, the cost would be thirty five dollars a person. Um, So I think that about covers it. Um, tonight's lesson is on how does a missionary retire? Um, our scripture focus for tonight's lesson is from Acts 20, 24. And at this time, we'll go ahead and have Pastor Toby to come and bring tonight's devotion. vocabulary uh, for for pastors uh, and it should not be in the vocabulary for Christians uh, when it comes about doing God's work uh, we, we we never retire uh, we're, we're always about doing the business and so how does a missionary retire from full-time missionary work I guess should be the the, the real question uh, tonight. Uh, and so we're going to look at uh, the book of Acts this evening, uh, chapter 20. I, I want to begin with uh, verse 17 uh, this evening. Uh, verse 17, and we're going to read down through verse 38, but our text will come from uh, verse 24. Verse 17 says, From uh, Miletus, 
uh, he sent, and we're talking about uh, Paul, uh, Miletus is, well, we'll show you here in the, on the map here in a little bit, but it's just south of Ephesus. And he sends to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed to, to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. <clears throat> Excuse me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men for I have shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which is purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. And therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or our appeal. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the word of our Lord Jesus that said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. So verse 17, it says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and called for the elders of the church. I've got a map here that uh, really shows you where this is. And I know you probably can't see much on this, but I wanted to show this one first because this shows the three missionary journeys that Paul was on. I mean, when you're talking about a missionary retiring, you can hear in his words and his passion that he speaks about in this, in this passage. I mean, what a great missionary to talk about, amen? Uh, I mean, three missionary journeys, and you can see all the distances that he, he traveled in these, and of course, this is all three of them, the, the red, the blue, and, and, and the brown in here, uh, and it shows all of the missionary, uh, or all the places that Paul went on those three separate missionary journeys. Now, this one, uh, if you will, it's, it's this area right here blown up, okay? And so here's Ephesus, and this is Miletus. It's, it's about 20 to 30 miles uh, south of, of Ephesus. 
And, and so Paul, he begins his, his, his message here. I mean, he's, he's, he's going around and, and things are, I mean, we just, we just seen him uh, in Tarsus here and, and he preached all night long and, and it's where the guy fell out of the window and, 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 and died and Paul threw himself over him and recovered him and, 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 and brought him back to life. But anyhow, Paul is, is here in Miletus. Instead of going back to Ephesus himself, he sends for the elders to come down to where he was at because of all the things that were going on. And, and so he, he he's... He's really wanting to give this group, I mean, this is a, a wonderful, I don't know if you want to call it a sermon or not, but uh, he, he explains to them what, what, what he's been doing. He says, and when they came to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia and what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with all tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. He, he, he's, he's, he's pouring out his heart to these, these, these elders and, and telling them, hey, you know what I have done in the past. You know, you know my ministry you know what I've done and and it reminds me a lot of missionaries they 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 pack up and they leave we got a neighbor just a few houses down from us and they, they sold everything I mean uh, they had a yard sale and I mean everything got sold and they they packed up and they they went to the mission field you know I mean they go and they give their life they go to a new culture and a lot of times it's in areas where they don't know the culture or they don't know the language and 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 this is what Paul did his you know from from the time he he went out and, and started his missionary journeys and 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 all that and he 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 done all these things not only for the for the Jews but for the Gentiles and then he says I came back uh, how I kept back nothing that was helpful but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house I think it was the last missionary missionary service we talked about they go with one suitcase only <laughs> you know I mean, could, I mean pack up everything you got right now leave but you can only take one suitcase that's a big call that's a big that's big giving up things amen and and so that's what Paul has done he's done that himself testifying to the Jews and also the Greeks the repentance toward God the message of the gospel the hope of the gospel he'd done that for all these years and then to see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem and that the word spirit here is 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 in the New King James, it's a little s. I don't know if if you have your Bibles open to that, but some Bibles have a capital S, and and so there's the the, the, the scholars debate on whether it meant His Spirit or the Holy Spirit, and and so you know uh, I, I I can imagine it both ways here, you know to 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 leave what He's done all His life and 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 it, it's got to be burdensome on your spirit. It's got to be something that oh you know it, it affects you. Uh, but it also, you know, that the Holy Spirit is leading him to to this this direction in his life. Uh, except that the Holy Spirit, capital S here, and of course, because it's Holy Spirit, testifies in every city saying that that chains and tribulations await me. <laughs> there, there's no getting away from it, folks. There's no getting away. I mean, Paul was, I mean, under all kinds of tribulations and left for dead and beaten. I mean, if you would have received a, a resume for from Paul to be your pastor, you probably would have never accepted it all the things he, he had to go through and, and did and, and so forth and so on. But but here the Holy Spirit is you know is going before him and, and, and thankful for that. And then the, the text that we, we want to focus on tonight, but none of these things move me nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. None of these things move me. All the things he went through, all the things he endured, that wasn't the main thing. I mean, he went through everything he went through for the cause of Christ. And, and and he says there, you know, I've done so that I might finish the race with joy. 
I am satisfied with what I've done. For me to die is Christ for, and, and to live is gain, okay? Or for me to die is gain, or live is gain, for to, to die is Christ. And, and, and so he knew, he knew that what he's done, he's satisfied with. And, and, and yet we know even while he was in prison, while he was in prison, he still continued to minister and, and to write letters and so forth and so on. Uh, and so what a powerful message for us tonight. A, a message of, of hope that, that, that what we do for the cause of Christ doesn't finish when we get retirement age. We still got a race to run. We still got a ways to go. And it's all for the cause of Christ. And it's for His glory. And, and I, I challenge all of us tonight uh, not to quit, not to give up. Um, he, 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 he talks about, you know, uh, let me see if I can find it here. You know, uh, that, that what he's taught them, he says, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among the, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. We've got to be aware that there is an enemy. There's antichrists, not necessarily the antichrist, but antichrist. Those who are against Christ, it's going to rise up against the church. It's happening right now in, 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 in our world today. And, and, and our, our, our pulpits are going to be <laughs> pushed to conform to some of the things that's going on in our world today. And then he's, but, but what's scary is the next thing he says. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Sad to say, but as I was mentioning even Sunday morning in my message Sunday morning about the double-minded, sad to say there are some in the church that rise up to, to make themselves noticed or themselves the person. We can't, we can't. The best way to realize a counterfeit $20 bill is not to study all the fake counterfeits, but to study what a real $20 bill is. And it's the same way with woods or those rising up in the church. If we know the real thing, we won't be deceived. Amen. And that's what we got to do. And and back to back to what Paul's saying here. I mean, they gather around him and he prays for them, and 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 they weep and they you know it's a sad day. And and in our in our study tonight, we're going to see some of the uh, some of the retirees of our missionaries that have retired, and uh, yet they're still involved in ministry. Uh, in the in the in their churches, so I want to ask Chrissy to come back up this evening and, and share the rest of her lesson with us. All right, we have some fast facts here. To retire as a missionary for the Church of the Nazarene, one must have served at least 20 years of missionary service and be within three years of the official age of retirement in their country of origin. By the end of 2018, 227 missionaries will have retired from 16 world areas after living in nearly 90 countries. These retired missionaries have served a combined total of more than 6,200 years. 16 missionaries have served 40 or more years before retiring.
So the following missionaries that are fe fe are featured in this lesson. So um, the ones are Lindell and Kate K. Browning served in Jordan, Israel, and Cyprus for a total of 37 years as missionaries. For 22 years, Lindell served as field strategy coordinator for the Eastern Mediterranean field, and they raised four children in the Middle East. Jim and Kathy Radcliffe served in Papua New Guinea, where Jim was a general surgeon at the Kujip Nazarene Hospital for three, 33 years. Kathy used her degree in medical dietetics to work with nutrition projects as well as helping with others' ongoing ministries to families. They have six children, including Ben, who replaced his father as general surgeon at the Kujip uh, Hospital. Daryl and Verna Statton served 36 years in Africa, including pioneering the work in Tanzania, church planning in South Africa, and teaching full-time at Africa Nazarene University since 2000. They have three children. Mike and Julie Shally served five years in South Africa before pioneering the work in Namia for the next 31 years. Jim and Kay served 40 years dividing time between Taiwan and uh, Hong Kong and a creative access area, which is an area resistant to the gospel. So we're going to go ahead and get into the lesson this evening. The the lesson writer says, each year a new group of Nazarene global missionaries retires and typically returns to their country of origin. And they pack up collected belongings, but they always leave something behind, a big part of their heart. Retirement for a missionary is a world changing, is world changing, literally and they leave one world where they may have raised family, learned a new culture, developed an appreciation for new traditions, and become a person with a history that has grown them in very specific ways. Although missionaries return to their country of origin, every few years for a home assignment, that time is full of speaking in churches and at camps and sharing the good things God is doing on the field. While missionaries are busy on home assignment, they still must keep up with their field responsibilities. It is not a time when missionaries adjust back into their home cultures. Everyone who retires experiences adjustments and levels of grief. However, missionaries have the additional challenge of changing cultures. There are no shortcuts, and their adjustments home can take as long as adjusting to new culture took at the beginning of their assignment. They face many mixed emotions, and they welcome the joy of reuniting with family and friends but sorrow to leave people in places they have loved, like family and home. Every retiring missionary will tell you how grateful they are 
for their sending church, for those who have prayed and supported them during their years of service. Most can recount times when they know that someone was praying because situations would have had different endings without their prayer. So they do not take this support for granted, and they look for ways to express their appreciation tangibly and invite their passions and gifts in their local church, districts, and regions. So tonight we're going to look at five missionary families that have retired and see how we as church might find some specific ways that we can support them. Of course, prayer is the key, but what might be some other ways that we can show our support? Our first retired couple is Lindell and Kay Browning, who has um, number one. About three years before we left, we began to pray. When is, the, when is it time for us to leave here? Kay remembers. Lindell and Kay Browning had served in the Middle East for all 37 years of their missionary service. They had only been married five years before leaving for their new lives in the Middle East. Retiring from 37 years that define life, culture, and growth isn't easy. Quote, it wasn't just moving, Kay explains. It was saying goodbye to a life that had been rich and fulfilling. We had raised our family there, watched young pastors grow into leaders. Unquote. Knowing that it was time to leave didn't make their departure any easier. It's like when adult children leave home, there's a big hole in your heart, but you wouldn't wish them to come back because they need to grow on their own. The Brownings knew that retirement would enable other leaders to develop and grow. Still, it was heart-wrenching to put an ocean between them and the people they had lived among for so many years. Of course, family and church welcomed them back. However, it doesn't fast-forward missionaries into settlement. It's like Kay said, Lindell explained. It took three to four months to unpack boxes but unpacking lives takes longer. It takes longer because they change worlds and cultures. Most missionaries are third culture people. They have lived in a culture they didn't grow up in without rejecting the culture of the birth. It results in third culture perspectives, a combination of cultures where both, country, or both continue to inform their ideas about the world. It can be isolating. Kay describes it this way. We have looked like we are, were fitting in, but we weren't. While living overseas, we accepted our differences as did those around us. But back in our home country, we felt unsure of where we belonged. We viewed the world through a different lens than did many in our church and community. Another factor many returning missionaries face is that they leave part of their family in the country where they minister. You can hear pride mixed with longing from Kay when she talks about her daughter, Aaron, and son-in-law, Brian Ketchum, serving as missionaries in France. We used to be one time zone away from them. It's different now. Also, their oldest daughter stayed in Jerusalem where she works as a guidance counselor. While they came home to other adult children and grandchildren, a part of their family is still missing. They just FaceTime with a different part of the family. Add to these adjustments the fact that most retired missionaries begin their retirement with deputation in their country of origin before they officially finish their contracted missionary service. It postpones settlement. It takes much longer than expected to find our place in the local church, partially because we were busy speaking in churches in our home country for, for most of our first two years home, Kay says. The Brownings know they were 
The brownies know they are where they belong, but as with others, we have retired from a life of service on the mission field, feeling like they fit in their home culture takes long. And in spite of all the conflicts, I saw our national leaders and our uh, pastors so excited about the harvest that they're that they're already preparing themselves to reap. And uh, it's been exciting to see how our national leadership has developed to this point of them caring and sharing hope with the people who are marginalized, the people who are refugees, the uh, Syrian and Iraqi refugees, and they're really standing strong and not talking about the persecution that may be ahead, but they're talking about the harvest. So it's been real exciting to, to be back in that part of the world during these days. So if you could pray for them, for their uh, spiritual, emotional, and physical strength that during their time of ministry, when uh, over uh, millions and millions of refugees have fled to the neighboring countries, and the church is trying to be salt and light to that community, and pray for wisdom for them and opportunities to bring hope and share the good news with people. And uh, they count on your prayers and don't let them down. And remember, when you see the news, think the fact that you have family there and pray for them as you would be praying for your family because they are truly your brothers and sisters in Christ. Number two, Jim and Kathy Radcliffe. Jim and Kathy Radcliffe served as Papu, Papu New Guinea, which is known as PNG, from 1985 to 2018. Jim had just finished his residency as a general surgeon when they packed up and moved across the world. While PNG is a country with an incredible beauty, it has complex challenges that keep a general surgeon busier than he ever wanted to be. The question concerning when he retired was huge, just like it was for the Brownings. We often said that we needed a call from the Lord to leave PNG just as he had called us to go to PNG, Kathy acknowledged. Part of their retirement plan was that Jim would continue as a surgeon in his home country. But this choice also offered a unique transition. The biggest challenge had been for me to relearn and retool in the medicine of my home country. I am working as a, at a small hospital. I miss the close ties I had with medicine and surgery and sharing my faith that I had at the Mission Hospital. I still try to pray and witness, but have to be more circumspect. The cultural displacement also affected the Radcliffs. We did not anticipate being lonely at times, here and still not feeling like we were truly belong. It has been harder to make this transition than I thought it would be, Kathy added. Our local church has welcomed us warmly giving us space and time to find our place and service. However, we do feel like visitors in the same in some ways. They both agree that it would be good for if folks realize the tremendous change this year represents for those coming back from long term service overseas. Thank you. We are Jim and Kathy Radcliffe. We are from Xenia Nazarene Church, and we live and work in Papua New Guinea and have been there for the last 29 years. I'm Ben. And I'm Catherine Radcliffe. And we are headed to Papua New Guinea to go and work at the Nazarene Hospital. Uh, I grew up over there as a missionary kid. Mainly I do surgical evangelism, 
Kathy does a lot of things to support the missionary family and the missionary school. So I trained as a family doctor and I'm currently practicing a little bit here in the States as we prepare to go overseas and serve the Lord. And we're really excited about where the Lord is sending us and where He's taking us and what we're going to get to do when we get there. In high school at a youth camp, God specifically spoke to me about being a missionary and I just prayed as I read the Gospels and saw Jesus healing ministry and just prayed, Lord, if this is how you'd like me to serve, would you open the doors? And God opened the doors for medical school and uh, continued to answer prayers so we could be there. Over many years as a child, missionary books and as a teen, missionary speakers, just the Lord through His Spirit speaking to me to go to another country and then meeting Jim and him having the same calling was a confirmation of that. I said yes to the Lord, but it was really hard when we left the first time with little children to get on that plane. It was not easy, but the Lord has been faithful, and only in the Lord's plan would we have the blessing of them coming back uh, to serve Him in Papua New Guinea. So He's turned the difficult things into big blessings. Uh, the best experience so far has been the way that the Lord has shown us His call for us and letting us know that our lives are not uh, for us alone, that uh, the gifts of a family and education are things that He has given us to use for His glory. Ministering to patients and being able to connect with patients at such a vulnerable place in their lives and having the opportunity to share Christ with them, to be light in the darkness is such a gift um, and a privilege, really. One of the best experiences in my missionary career was being a part of a revival where men from the local village came to know Christ, and then and I got four guys from the village to disciple each week that came to my home and just got to see them grow in their faith and to see the transformational power of the gospel up close. To see God work miracles in our patients' lives those who are brought from death to life physically and spiritually is, continues to be such a blessing. The reward of seeing now young missionaries coming and young Papua New Guinean doctors are working mm. in our hospital and that was a dream from the beginning that we're seeing now. In the next hundred years I'd like to see the work in Papua New Guinea done by Papua New Guinean Christian surgeons uh, and so my dream would be to help train some Papua New Guinean surgeons who would do what the Lord has called me to do and to serve their country and their people and maybe the Lord will call them elsewhere as well. We've also recently had the opportunity to um, share with some college students who have a passion for missions and, and love the Lord. A dream for me in the next hundred years would be to see that passion throughout the generations just continue. And I pray that we would get to be a part of that, that we could pass on that passion and help to mentor and encourage those from this side of the globe to go to places that are unknown and unreached and, and share Christ. It would be neat to see young people continue to be called and some that would come long term, but just a complete involvement so that every believer would also see themselves as a part of the international church and get involved in giving and praying and going. That the, the whole church will see the world as their mission field in whatever way God leads them to get involved. I think we have an idea that missions means going to a, a foreign country and I think that's not necessarily true. There are many missional opportunities in our neighborhoods, at our workplaces, so my challenge to others would be listen and be open to whatever it is that God asks you to do, wherever that is, in whatever form that takes. To somebody interested in missions, I think I would add on to go now, to go soon, because you want that, that flame and that fire to continue to be ignited and not wait. But more importantly, go prepared. You want to do what you do well so that we can be a, a light to those and we can show them excellence in all areas of our lives and others will see that we're, we're not only doing our job well but that we are loving God well and we are loving others as a result. So it's easy to want to put things off and say oh when I finish this or when I've paid off this but I always think uh, when Jesus was calling the disciple and they wanted to date the one guy asked him well, I need to bury my parents or I need to do this or I need to do that and say no you got to drop everything and follow me. And when we are obedient, 
And God opens the doors and he provides the resources. So don't delay. Be obedient now. Trust God with everything you've got. He is always faithful. Uh, He is an awesome enabler. He will answer prayer. You can trust his adequate power to enable you to do what he calls you to do. It's a great journey trusting Jesus. He, if he calls, he equips, and he is able to guide. He guides from every realm on, all around our lives. I just know that as God calls, just step at a time, he will lead. funny how the Lord, he'll set things before you to help you along the way. And, and I see this in missionaries. They, they put their whole heart out for things that need to be done to help others to know. Him. All right, now we'll do um, Daryl and Verna stat number three. Why is that? Daryl and Verna Statton, they went to Africa in 1982 as missionaries with a four-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter, while a second daughter was born in Africa. They served in Zambia, South Africa, Tanzania, and had been full-time teaching at the African Nazarene University in Kenya since 2000. The biggest shock that they faced as they retired was the high cost of living in their home country. We wonder how well retirement benefits from the government and from our Nazarene pension would meet our retirement needs. They aren't alone. When missionaries return from living in places with low cost of living to places of a higher cost of living, it could make adjustments more difficult. Many are used to simple lifestyles. However, simple doesn't always pay the bills, especially when health care is involved. Where to live was another big challenge for the Stantons. All of their three grown children and their and my dad would like us to live near them, but they are all far apart. Fortunately, the Stantons had housing through the generosity of Bethany, Oklahoma, USA First, Naz- First Church during their year of dep- deputation and a couple of months beyond. Their question about their next step were answered before their last month was finished at Bethany. Darrell had been hired as a SDMI Global Resource Coordinator at the Global Missionary Center, GMC, in Lenza, Kansas. They had purchased a townhouse and lived near their daughter and son-in-law and only grandson. God rewarded our patience and has blessed us. Thank you. I'm Dr. Daryl Stanton. I joined African Nazarene University in 1997 as a part-time lecturer and I lectured part-time for two years before I became full-time and since that time I have been a chair of department as well as academic advisor for religion and in education. We've been able to help the university develop a number of new programs and these have been 20 very good years for us. Hi, I'm Verna Stanton and I began teaching the health unit. It's called Personal Family Community Health HIV and AIDS. I started in 2003, so this is my 15th year to teach the same uh, unit, and I have taught it in all the modes, the 
distance and the main campus and the town campus and the school based school teachers coming in and I have also taught another unit child care and nutrition with the school teachers and I've learned a lot teaching the students and I've interacted with very many students since this is a required unit and gotten to know students from all of the majors. It's been an enjoyable experience and very busy and time flies by. I was involved in the committee that actually discussed the starting of this university back in December 1983. We realized we needed a liberal arts college, is what we were calling it back then, to train the laity of the church in addition to the pastors. And so we discussed it and by good luck or the grace of God, uh, the next year, Dr. Smelzenball came to Kenya and the commission here was open to private universities. And because I'd been involved in the initial discussion for the university when I moved here in 1992, I talked to the different people. I was working with the Bible College and with Church Girls at that time. But in the year, two more years, the university did get this letter of interim authority. And so when I came back to Kenya in 1997, I was the country coordinator for the Church of the Nazarene. And so I came by just to pay a call on the university as kind of the Oscopo for Kenya and said, let me know any way that I can assist the university. And they said, we want you to teach. So I started teaching part-time for two years. And at the end of that time, we had a large exit of religion department lecturers. And so they asked me to teach full time. So I had a year of transition between being a school for, for Kenya and then coordinating the department, teaching full time during that year. Starting the 6th of December, we are officially on home assignment, means that we'll go back to the USA and we'll visit churches for one year. And that year we'll say thank you for supporting us as missionaries for 36 good years and for supporting the church in Africa. And then we'll give them reports on what God has been doing on these years in Africa and especially at African Nazarene University. After that, I keep in the moon. For the opportunity I had to teach here, I am a nurse by profession, but then I was um, invited to teach this unit and I've enjoyed teaching it, enjoyed meeting uh, many, many students over the years and I've been excited to hear that some of them have gone out and, and made differences in their community and um, it's it's been a good experience, one I never ever dreamed would happen, but we will be excited through all of the social media to see what's happening in the future with um, students that are making a change in Kenya and beyond. God bless Africa. God bless a and &E. She talked about Speltenbaum or however you say his name. I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, that was Howard, that was his son. And when he went over there to Kenya, and, and he tells this to me, I think he might be dead, but anyhow, he tell, he told the story about how they obtained the property, and, and I mean, it's a wonderful story. If you ever, if we ever get the video or hear that testimony, it's something that would be really good for Missionary Night. I mean, it's just, it was powerful, of how, how God worked that university out there. All right, Mike and Julie Shally, experience four. There was so much to do, not only with the work, but also closing down the house and sorting through 36 years of accumulation and memories. This meant getting rid of most everything and breaking it down to a small shipment. Those are the Julie, Sh are Julie Ch Shalley's words about getting ready to retire from serving as the only missionaries in Namibia since 1984. 
They also faced a culture shock in returning to their home country, just trying to understand the government regulations regarding retirement benefits from the government was overwhelming. And where do you settle after 36 years out of the country? That was a big question. The Shalleys also found that the church had changed drastically. They didn't know the songs, the structure of worship. While they never expected the church to remain the same, when one returns after such a long absence to reconnect, one can understand how they might feel like a fish out of water. At a time when they longed for re reconnection, they added church to their long list of adjustments. Julie especially struggled with one part of retirement that she wasn't sure how to resolve at first. She knew she had a call to missionary service. She also knew that retirement from God's call was not part of the plan. I asked the Lord, what was I supposed to do with this call? And God answered, did you think that call was just for Namibia? That reassurance from God that he didn't want her to retire from her call, her call helped in her adjustment. God proved to the Shalleys that their call wasn't just for Namibia. With great excitement, Julie reports that God extended his call in both of their lives. We were asked to take over Christian Literature for Africa, or CLA, shortly after our retirement date. CLA is a nonprofit organization that collects books, Bibles, and pastors' educational materials and ships them to various countries in Africa. CLA is located in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is the town we retired to. Not only do we have contacts throughout Africa, but with our Namibian family. God has grown our family to include so many wonderful people, both here at home and in Africa. Through CLA, lives are being touched and changed for eternity. We are blessed to have a part in this ministry. Thank you. Number five, the Jim and Kay experience. Jim and Kay served 17 years in Taiwan, 16 in Hong Kong, and five and a half, one half years in a creative access area, an area resistant to the gospel. As they approached retirement, they didn't want to face it unprepared. They had observed some Nazarene missionaries who seemed to face retirement totally unprepared, Jim remembers. Jim and Kay did more than financial planning. About 12 years prior to our retirement, we asked three pastors of close acquaintance to pray for our adjustment when we would eventually retire. They were also proactive, proactive with specific questions about finances and started saving early. You will find them today reinvesting their call in several ways in their local church. They love giving mission lessons to the children and volunteering as readers in the literacy outreach ministry of their church. Jim also teaches in the course of study for Nazarenes called into ministry. They may have retired from their international service, but they still consider themselves on call for God. I lost my place.
Common denominators. Retirement presents that off again. Retirement presents many changes for missionaries, including departure from their country of service and return to a place they once called home. It creates displacement, adjustment, and sometimes feelings of isolation, but it also presents new opportunities to minister in their home country, using their understanding to other cultures to advance the kingdom of God. It allows them to reconnect with family and friends from whom they've been separated for so long, and it provides opportunity to encourage the church who sent them out in missions many years before. These connections become a source of blessings to both the retiring missionaries and the church. The cost of retirement is always a big issue. What many missionaries could li live on in the field is not the same as what they need to return to their country of origin. They join an aging population needing medical care which also comes at a high cost in many contexts. Addressing budget, understanding government provisions, and finding housing, connecting to the right people at the right time can be dawning. Retirement for missionary missionaries bring pluses and losses, and the work they gave their heart to in their country of service may change as others step, others step into their places of service. And of course, they will give their heart to new work in the countries to which they return. They leave people who grew in their hearts to return to family and friends who missed easy connections with them. Missionaries usually understand that there will always be unknowns in following God's will and timing. They have practiced trust as a part of their obedience, and they can teach us vulnerable lessons about adjusting to the unexpected. So then, how can we help? Beyond the welcoming parties and gathering supplies for resettlement, there are other ways we can be the church to surround our returning missionaries with as much fever as we sent them to serve. Here are a few ideas. Ask retired missionaries to share their legacy stories. Two, ask how their experiences change their perspective. Ask them to teach you a skill they learned. Be deliberate about welcoming them into your community. And five, express your gratitude for their service. Six, enlist retired missionaries to help. By sponsoring a work and witness team to a country where the retired missionary served. Sponsor a child through Nazarene Compassionate Ministries. 
and invite missionaries to your church district who are serving where your retired missionaries served. Use missionaries' unique understanding of a world area or people group to connect to people from that area in your community and district. Give to missionary support accounts. Finding a home. We're all we've all heard that home is where your heart is. And missionaries will always have more than one home. However, we should do whatever we can to give their hearts a new place to call home when they retire. Love, shared lessons, mutual support will go a long way to help them enjoy another season of service we can learn from. All right, at this time, we don't have Angie here for to do our um, uh, prayer for our mobilization line. So um, I figure we'll just go ahead and um, do prayer requests that we have here within the church. And um, I have a girlfriend, Jeannie. She had uh, some issues with her veins and her legs. She had to have surgery done. Um, need to remember her. She, I think, is still in the hospital. Okay. Anybody else? Colleen? Anyone else? Randy? I've got this, I've got that prayer mobilization. It, uh, here's a few of them. Uh, Amber and Marcia Bastia serving in the Philippines. Please pray for Amber and Marcia as they speak to the churches prior to going to the Philippines. Also request pray for the uh, Bastia family as they transition to serve in the Philippines. And then Astrid and Joan Camacero serving in Paraguay. Uh, please join the Paramacos in prayer for their planning of 14 churches by December 2020 and for new leaders established to, for, to establish those churches. Uh, also Astrid and Joan would like to see revival by God in the current churches as they will be dynamic passionate for Christ and evangelists to their neighbors. Also, please pray for, for them as they uh, will be healthy and strong in their service to the Lord. And then John and, and Miramo Jewel serving in Uganda. John and Miramo ask for prayer as they extend holiness message to people groups around them and that those groups will reach neighboring countries as well. Pray for their development disciples who will make disciples. Pray for the churches to welcome refugees and immigrants and integrate them into their communities and they uh, and also the Yules request prayer for strong district and compassion for uh, the mission of uh, making Christ like disciples. Um, let's not forget to the new link missionaries that we have um, the Swatskis uh, in Eurasia, remember them. And how about we join together in a circle and I'll have Pastor Toby uh, do the prayer.
egg shape. creative area. 